All free episodes of Addressing Gettysburg are brought to you by our sponsors and our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. To become a sponsor, send an email to matt at addressing Gettysburg.com. And to be a patron, go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg today. And we thank you in advance. So how's everybody doing tonight? Uh, Good. I didn't know how many people would show up tonight after having a full house last night. Oh, that's Looks like at least, uh, yeah, it's a semi-different crowd. I think there's... Uh, uh, 7, 8, 10, 10, 12 people here tonight that were here last night for our movie extravaganza. If you'd like to learn more about the uh, uh, podcast we did live here last night, I'm sure uh, um, it'll be on Addressing Gettysburg and you can listen to it. Like uh, this one will be recorded by Addressing Gettysburg. But we had a really interesting uh, program about the making of movie Gettysburg and uh, the involvement in the Farnsworth House in the making of, and uh, it's very popular. Uh, and um, uh, we had a couple actors uh, from the movie that were here last night. Uh, Bo Brinkman and uh, Patrick Gorman were here, and I hope they had a good time. And uh, we had uh, lots of uh, positive reaction, lots of questions. Um, you know, I couldn't help, uh, one of the questions uh, that was brought up um, by one of your uh, Patreons was, uh, what Civil War movie would you like to see made? And, you know, I didn't answer that one, Matt, but I was couldn't help but think that the one I'd like to see is John Burns. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, because uh, good. I still do have, uh, you know, if you don't know, I still do have um, my uh, book uh, has, uh, you know, has a movie contract on it and is still active. And, Every once in a while, I get a check in the mail to keep renewing my contract. So we'll see if that ever gets made. So tonight's topic is the Iron Brigade. The first brigade of the first division of the first Army Corps. And you know, uh, it's been my experience over the years that a lot of people, um, there's a lot of hype around certain Civil War regiments that maybe they don't deserve. You know, like the 20th Maine, for instance, or that. Or even the 1st Minnesota. They lost a lot of men, but, you know, there's a lot of hype around that unit because of stories that circulated about how they lost more men than any other regiment at the battle, percentage-wise, and they're really, like, number 11, you know, things like that. Um, but the Iron Brigade, there's always been a lot of hype around the Iron Brigade. I think to be a, a famous Civil War individual or a Civil War unit, you have to have a cool name. Like, you know, the Stonewall Brigade. You know, the Iron Brigade, just their name is just right up there. And then, of course, uh, when I was a, a teenager, I don't remember the year it came out, but uh, um, the Iron Brigade came out by Alan Nolan. So a really good study of the Iron Brigade. That if you're into the Iron Brigade, you should every you know you should uh, uh, take an opportunity and read. But the Iron Brigade uh, maybe is famous because of their name. But their actions at Gettysburg were also um, up there in you know among the actions of any unit. Uh, according to Pusey and Martin's. Uh, Regimental Strengths and Losses, which is the, st the study that most of us use and respect for the numbers of the battle. Uh, they have 1,829, uh, you know, a strength in the battle. So uh, 1,500 is about an average size of a brigade. So they are a little big for a brigade, 1,829. And they lost 1,153 men, killed or wounded or captured or missing. And that is the highest loss of any northern brigade in the battle. And of course, in the southern uh, army, Pettigrew's brigade uh, had the highest numerical loss. They lost 63% of their men in the fighting, and that's the fourth highest percentage-wise brigade loss, percentage-wise. Of course, some units that had a higher percentage loss had less men. Um, the brigade as a whole, had 171 men killed outright and um, 720 wounded. And both those numbers, that's the number one highest number of killed in a brigade for the Northern Army at Gettysburg, and that is the number one uh, wounded 
Because, you know, some brigade, some units that lost casualties lost men who were captured, and um, uh, so that inflates their uh, percentage-wise. The 24th Michigan Infantry of the Iron Brigade, the 24th Michigan had 496 men and lost 363. And it depends on what, what's, um, what actual figures you use. Uh, some figures are higher in their losses. And it, I guess it depends on how you count casualties. But basically, they had 500 men going into the battle, and they lost about 400 of the 500. So the 24th Michigan um, lost um, a huge amount of their men. Depending, again, on the numbers you prefer to use, they lost between 77% and 80% of their men um, in the fighting, something like that. Um, the second Wisconsin lost 77% of their men. And largely, the second Wisconsin's losses were all just in the morning of the first day of the battle. Another statistic I often uh, refer to if I talk about the Iron Brigade's losses is the fact that um, the 24th Michigan Infantry lost the highest, they had the highest loss of any northern regiment in the battle. And they fought against the 26th North Carolina. The 26th North Carolina suffered the highest loss of any Confederate unit in the battle. The second highest um, loss of any Confederate unit in the battle is the 11th North Carolina, which fought right beside the 26th North Carolina. And the second highest loss of any unit in the Northern Army is 151st Pennsylvania that were a second line of defense after the 24th Michigan fell back against Pettigrew's brigade that was coming up through that woods. So the area where the Iron Brigade fought in the first day's battle is arguably the bloodiest single portion of the fighting of the battle at any time. You know, just that small quadrant of ground out on the first day's battlefield that we call Herps Woods. So having said that, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Iron Brigade. And you know, what's funny about this is I don't talk about the Iron Brigade a lot. Oh, I should, should I mention that um, uh, in the 1990s, I'm going to guess it was like 1995 or 1996, I gave a talk about the Iron Brigade of Gettysburg at a seminar, and Alan Nolan was at that seminar. So, and I remember afterwards, we went out that night together. He was in a wheelchair. He had lost he had a lot of, he had a bunch of strokes. He had lost the use of the side of his body, and he could barely lift his double bourbon. <laughs> it was, you know, so he was, he was quite an individual. Yeah, he refused to stop drinking. Until a little bit later. But, um... He loved the Iron Brigade. I, when I, when I uh, saw him, it was kind of interesting. Um, he, he was pretty well known in Civil War circles because he wrote a book called Lee Considered. Have you read Lee Considered? A, kind of a anti robert E. Lee book. And he was getting a lot of grief for that. So you know what I did? I sang him my song, Lee the Butcher. How does that go? Oh, yeah. I can stop. Well, you know, I we keep threatening. One day I'm going to record it for you guys. Okay, but the, but since you asked, one of the verses at the end is, "In lines they, oh, let's see, in lines they charged across the field. Their ranks were ripped and torn, trampling Southern comrades. No, that's not it. <laughs> trampling fellow comrades. There was no time to mourn." Charging double canister, the skies were filled with lead. The stench of death was in the air. The ground was turning red. The regiments of the Iron Brigade, um, in no particular order, the 19th Michigan, the 19th Indiana, and here uh, their Colonel William W. Dudley of the 19th Indiana. Um, and they, have, of course, have a monument. All these units have a monument on the first day's battlefield. The 24th Michigan, which was at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, a, uh, a unit that had 
uh, a newer unit that had joined the Iron Brigade. They were not with the Iron Brigade in Antietam, for instance. And uh, Colonel Henry Morrow, they're the um, Wayne County Regiment to a man, the whole regiment, uh, almost to a man, was from Wayne County, Michigan. Um, the second Wisconsin with their <coughs> Colonel Lucius Fairchild, who is a badass. <laughs> no doubt about it. Um, he was uh, wounded, lost his arm at the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, became a, the governor of Wisconsin after the Civil War, and he was the head, maybe him and the governor of Minnesota, but he was the head of the, the Bloody Shirters. Have you heard of the Bloody Shirters after the war? Anytime anyone even suggested giving something back to the South or allowing them to have equal, more equal rights, he would wave the bloody shirt. In his case, his empty sleeve. You know, I lost my arm for this war. These guys did this to us. We should not have them off the hook. So, you know, the, the Northwestern states were especially uh, anti-Southern in the years after the war. And he was kind of one of the leaders of that party in that movement. Um, here is uh, Rufus Dawes, the 6th Wisconsin. So, um, uh, I, I should mention, one of the nice things about the Iron Brigade, if you're a fan of this particular unit and you want to read about them, is the fact that there's so many well-written books. Not now, but at the time, by the veterans. Uh, for instance, we mentioned Alan Nolan's Iron Brigade, but the Second Wisconsin has a book by a guy named Otis, um, came out in the 1890s, I believe, and it's filled with uh, first-hand accounts of the Second Wisconsin. And the 24th Michigan, there's a, a regimental history by O.B. Curtis with a huge Gettysburg chapter with plenty of details by the veterans themselves. And, of course, Service with the Sex by Rufus Dahls is one of the best regimental histories in existence. So, I don't know if you're into Rufus Dahls. I've always been into Rufus Dahls. His grandfather rode with Paul Revere, William Dahls, one of the three people that rode out of Boston, uh, warning the uh, Boston or the you know Massachusetts militia. Um, his son, Charles Dahls, was the vice president of the United States, and uh, of course he was um, you know involved in the Battle of Gettysburg and you know, his book is just great. And then the seventh Wisconsin, it doesn't get as much as attention as some of the other units in the brigade, but um, uh, William Robinson. Uh, after Solomon Meredith, the commander of the Iron Brigade, is wounded early in the first day's fight, it's William Robinson that commands the Iron Brigade in the first day's battle. Now, I'm going to talk about the Iron Brigade in the early morning of the first day's battle and a little bit in the afternoon, but I, I, I've done this program a number of times and I realize that I have so much to talk about with the Iron Brigade that I'll try to you know, move it along, but I tend to talk more about the morning action of the first day. And when you go out there on the battlefield and you visit the monuments of the Iron Brigade, I think they would like it if we would only talk about the morning and the first day of the battle. Because it's where they do really well. They don't want to talk, us to talk too much about the rest of the battle. And then you might know that Battery B, 4th U.S. Artillery, is an Iron Brigade battery. And this is the United States Regular Army Artillery Unit. And... Uh, when I wrote my book on Lee's headquarters and I highlighted the fighting on Seminary Ridge, I highlighted this battery because in the afternoon action, the first day, they are in front of the Thompson House and that's their position. So um, I had an account by James Stewart, who's the commander of Battery B, and uh, I wanted to flesh out information about them. When I went to the National Archives and I pulled the... Um, muster rolls for the 4th United States Infantry, only 11 guys in the unit were assigned to that unit, were in Battery B. The rest of the guys in that unit, and um, I forget exactly how many we're talking about, but 90 guys, are on detached duty from the Iron Brigade. So most of the guys in this unit are guys that are assigned to the battery but are really in the other infantry units of the Iron Brigade. Battery B, 4th U.S. Artillery, suffered uh, the second highest 
casualty figures for an artillery unit in the Northern Army during the Battle of Gettysburg. Anybody want to guess what artillery unit suffered the most casualties? It was overrun during the battle. Cushing at the angle. And um, excuse me for not knowing, is that Battery A, 40th US? <laughs> I forget. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What text do you work for? Right here. Okay. And then also, I should mention a neat, neat little fact. Did you ever read uh, Fox's Fighting 300? It's a book by a guy in the 107th of New York written after the war about units that had heavy losses during the Civil War. And he lists who lost how many at different battles. Battery B, in the top five losses of an artillery unit in a battle in the Civil War, Battery B is in there twice in the top five. <laughs> Not good. They lost heavily at Gettysburg, and they, all, they all, you know, almost, almost lost one of their guns as the Confederates were overrunning Seminary Ridge. And there was another battle that Battery B was in that they lost heavily, and it's pretty famous action. Anybody know what other unit battle they were? Antietam. Antietam, good. They were committed by a guy named Campbell in Antietam, and they were at the cornfield, and they were holding back the Texans. You know, there's Texans. <coughs> the Hood's Texas Brigade they were firing into. So they lost heavily in Antietam and Gettysburg. So I find that very interesting, and, and they're a really good unit. Uh, you might know that one of the more popular Civil War books at the time that Civil War veterans were writing histories was The Cannoneer. And the book was published as a series of articles in the National Tribune weekly newspaper, and then uh, eventually it was uh, made into a book. And a lot of veterans bought it and read it, and up until the 1960s, it was used widely in Gettysburg literature. And then... Um, people started to realize that there were some details in it that didn't make sense. And the guy who wrote the book was actually not in the battery. It was kind of a, a book he wrote about the battery, and he inserted himself in the story and wrote about it as if he had eyewitnessed the events himself. So it's a little dramatic and over the top because of that. So now, during the Gettysburg campaign, like many other units in the Army of the Potomac, um, you know, the Iron Brigade, uh, according to the different accounts, uh, found the campaign especially grueling. Um, a member of the 24th Michigan recorded that from the Rappahannock to Gettysburg, it was 165 miles that they marched over a course from early June until June 30th. Um, William H. Harries of the 2nd Wisconsin remembered that from the time they crossed the Potomac till Tuesday, the last of June, the marches were rapid and long, most of the time through the mud and rain. Now you probably know that it rained heavily after the battle, but it also rained uh, heavily prior to the battle on the march northward. In a letter written on June 30th, Colonel Rufus Dawes of the 6th Wisconsin wrote, I don't think I ever before saw uh, at this time of the year such a long, continuous, misty, drizzling storm as we have marched through since we crossed the Potomac. So it, it rained quite a lot on their, on their march northwards. Of course, they camped um, on June 29 in Emmitsburg. It's a deal the map. And on June 30th, they camped at Marsh Creek um, in Freedom Township. And uh, we're going to talk about that in a moment here. I should mention, on June 30th, it was a pretty light day's march for the Iron Brigade. Um, basically, they marched from the area of Emmitsburg, Maryland, to um, Marsh Creek. They marched... Five miles. Look, I got my pointer. I found my pointer. <laughs> so they marched from Emmitsburg to Marsh Creek. And they got to Marsh Creek about noon. And that was it. They camped for the day. And one thing that I always like to make uh, a point of uh, letting people know is that it's June 30th. It's 
the end of the bi-monthly period when they do their monthly reports and everybody gets paid on June 30th. Right. So they have lots of uh, regimental business to do at the end of the day. So they camped early. They only marched five miles on June 30th, and they went into camp about noon. Now, while they're in camp, we have several accounts that General Buford's cavalry passes by them on the Emmitsburg Road and rides up to Gettysburg. And undoubtedly, General Buford stops and talks to General Reynolds. And undoubtedly, this is a face-to-face -face discussion. Do you know in the official reports we have the messages between Reynolds and Buford and Buford and headquarters and Reynolds and headquarters? And people who write about it don't seem to understand or take into account that these guys talk to each other face to face. And it's because we don't have an account of it. So, you know, we have to assume that they were pretty much on the same page when they stopped and talked to each other. But actually, that's not my point. <laughs> my point is that then Buford comes to Gettysburg, and Buford gathers information, and Buford sends that information back to Reynolds and the Army Command. And Buford has no idea that the Confederates are marching to Gettysburg on July 1st. So, like, for instance, if you watch the movie, you know, Buford gets out there and he's like, uh, wow, you know, they're going to get to Gettysburg, you know, they're going to they're gonna come through town, they're going to capture Gettysburg, and I forget exactly how he puts it in the movie. And then they're going to run to Gettysburg, not over battle. I remember, you know what I remember? I remember that they filmed that scene that day with um, Sam Elliott, and that night I happened to be in here, and I talked, I heard them, the actors talking about how they filmed that scene like six times, and they still don't know what he said. <laughs> but no, um, being serious, um, over, the, over the years since the battle, people have portrayed July 1st as a race. Boy, what does is, uh, what is, uh, Colonel Gamble say? Boy, I hope it doesn't rain. I don't want anything to hold up the troops getting here tomorrow morning. They only marched five miles on, on June 30th, and they camped at noon. If anybody had thought for any reason that there would be a battle at Gettysburg on July 1st, any time that afternoon, they could have marched to Gettysburg. Any time that night, they could have marched to Gettysburg. Any time early the next morning, they could have marched to Gettysburg. And the Northern Army could have had 10,000 men standing on Seminary Ridge when Heath, Heath's brigade attacked. But they didn't, because guess what? They don't know the Southern Army is coming to Gettysburg on July 1st until the next day when the first shot is fired and they see the column coming down the road and then they put all the information together and realize that you know the troops are coming and then they have to bring troops there in a hurry. So I always think that's, that's a fascinating aspect of things. But on this map, you might notice that on June 30th, I, um, it didn't show up so well on my map, but I put the three divisions of the First Corps in um, circles of their division color. You see that? Yeah. Okay, the white one's hard to see. <laughs> so um, there's uh, the Iron Brigade camped around um, uh, Marsh Creek, and then uh, and they're with the first division, and then the second division is camped back near the Maryland Pennsylvania line on the Emmitsburg Road, and they're in the white circle, and then the blue circle is the third division, Double Day's division, which is camped along Bullfrog Road. So you kind of see that. Also, I have two dots on the map. One is the Burt's Tavern where General Reynolds has his headquarters in the middle of the three divisions, and then the red dot, which we know for a fact is the skirmish line of the 19th Indiana that night. So according to, um, according to the best accounts that we have, um, uh, Colonel William Hoffman of the 56th Pennsylvania, uh, of course that's in Cumberland's Brigade, says that Solomon Meredith went into camp on the north bank of Marsh Creek, about 200 yards beyond his position. Um, according to George W. Downing of Company K, 6 Wisconsin, they went into camp about noon on the north bank of the Bass Run. 
Never heard it called Bass Run before. Um, another source states that 6th Wisconsin was camped near the pike, which leads from Emmitsburg to Gettysburg. So we don't have any specific information about them. Uh, one good account from the 88th Pennsylvania of Robinson Division, the next day, he says they crossed a covered bridge over Marsh Creek. And he actually says, oh, Rufus Northrop of the 90th Pennsylvania says that there was a sign on the bridge warning that $5 penalty for driving faster than a walk when crossing. <laughs> and we have a sign at the Adams County Historical Society that says exactly that, that hung on one of the bridges. Also, I did see one account where they were ordered to break step when they crossed the covered bridge. Can you imagine that? In other words, they're not, you know, if they all march in unison, the bridge might, you know, you know, start to rock and collapse. So they break their um, step when they go across the bridge. I think that's fascinating. So here is the Mertz Tavern. Um, this is a photograph you might know that uh, I discovered um, uh, it's not labeled at the Adams County Historical Society a few years ago. Um, I know it's the Mertz Tavern for a few reasons, not the least of which I took it out to it and I lined up the bricks on it to make sure it was the right tavern. But uh, there's another similar photograph to this that appears in the Gettysburg National Military Park collection. Are you aware that they have four chairs on display in the National Military Park Museum from Mertz Tavern that you know supposedly Reynolds used when he was there? So um, the Mertz Tavern was uh, owned by, um, or at the time of the battle, is run by um, uh, Samuel Mertz. Mertz is spelled M-O-R-I-T-Z, like Moritz, but locally it's pronounced Mertz. John Nicholas Mertz had operated the tavern from 1839, but he died in March of 1833. And of course this is uh, Reynolds' uh, headquarters on June 30th. Got this excellent account uh, from a local family history, the Shriver family history. There's a little boy sitting on the fence at the tavern when Reynolds comes up. And uh, I don't know if the boy's a little chubby or not, but the Reynolds stops and looks at him and says, I'll bet your mom's a good cook. <laughs> and he has his staff officer write a note to Mrs. Shriver, and he says, here, give us to your mother. And the note asks if she'll bring the general breakfast the next morning. So Alice Shriver makes General Reynolds breakfast and his staff and shows up the next morning and they are, the general and his you know, uh, group are ecstatic. And General Reynolds gives her $5. She didn't want to take any money from him, but he insisted that she take the money. And then uh, there's some cannons firing and he rides off to Gettysburg. And then later she learns that she gave him his last meal. And so, you know, um, she's very proud of that. And, and there's a whole description of this in the, in the family history. Okay. So, also I wanted to mention this incredible story. This has got to be, okay, you know how I really go over the top into these minute stories that don't really have that much meaning, but they're important to me. <laughs> So here is the skirmish line in the 19th Indiana. So the 19th Indiana doesn't get to relax on the night of uh, June 30th, going into camp, you know, around, uh, um, you know, around noon. And, but what had happened was, remember, Buford had ridden from uh, Monterey to Fairfield and got engaged in a battle at Fairfield out here, a little skirmish, and then rode to Emmitsburg and then around up the Emmitsburg Road uh, to Gettysburg. And he obviously told Reynolds about the skirmish he had that morning at Fairfield. And from Fairfield, there's a road, Bullfrog Road, that comes right into the place where he's encamped. He's got to be careful. And so he has Double Day's division sort of camped in line of battle along Bullfrog Road, and he's got a skirmish line now just in case the Southern Army marches towards his position. And in the skirmish line, or I should say directly behind the skirmish line, um, is a bunch of the officers. 
And according to this account, the uh, Lieutenant Colonel William W. Dudley of the 19th uh, Indiana remembered that with a number of other soldiers and some officers of some other regiments who had come forward to this farmhouse, they have a dinner, and then afterwards there was a dance in the barn to the time of the fiddle in which the Riddle Moser girls flung the light fantastic with a number of soldiers gallant. What? Okay, so the Riddle Moser daughters <laughs> dance with the soldiers in their barn. And I've gone way out of my way to figure out where this such site is. So basically, it's where Boyd's Bears is located. Or if you remember what the Boyd's Bear going? If you're not, it's still there, and it still stands out there. And behind it, there's a driveway that goes down to the old Riddle Mosel farm. And according to the census, the Riddle Moser girls are Mary, age 20, Martha, age 18, Virginia, age 16, and Lucinda, age 12. So the daughters of Henry and Harriet Riddle Moser. And oh, by the way, I don't have any photographs of the Riddle Moser girls. So if you happen upon them, you, you let me know. Okay? So um, according to William uh, W. Dudley, Dudley met an old friend that same evening, Lieutenant Colonel John B. Callis of the 2nd Wisconsin. They were enjoying the good things to eat, and while sitting on a log, smacking their lips over the feast, thoughts of the approaching fight intruded. Dudley remarked, or Dudley remarked, Well, John, let's go get a furlough tomorrow. An expression current among soldiers of being relieved for duty by being wounded. And we'll come back here, and we'll be fed back to life by these Dutch girls. His companion jovially responded, All right, you get it in the guts, and I'll get it in the leg. And the two laughed over the prospect, little dreaming that the morrow would bring them the furlough, but under reverse conditions. Lieutenant Colonel Callis was shot in the chest, um, and he suffered. He... He was in the, near the unfinished railroad cut, and he was laying in a railroad cut for a couple days. There was a great account where in North Carolina, Officer Daniel's Brigade finds him and helps him a little bit. And uh, for years and years, uh, he has trouble. Um, uh, I think it's, according to his pension record, like in the 1890s, in a hospital, he goes into a coughing fit, and he coughs up a piece of his uniform. That had been, you know, dri driven into his lung by the bullet. That's according to his, that's, you know, it's in his pension. I don't know. Um, so, and uh, William Dudley, W. Dudley, the colonel of the 19th Indiana, he was shot in the leg in the charging Iron Brigade, um, uh, I think in the afternoon action. And uh, he was taken into town, and his leg was later amputated. I think his leg ended up being amputated in Little's Town. And um, uh, so, uh, he lost his leg. Now, I, I had this Riddle Moser account, and I've been, you know, uh, interested in it for years, and I told people about it. But, you know, when finally when um, newspapers.com became available, you could search digitally newspapers all over the country. Of course, I searched. I was searching for the Riddle Moser girls and trying to find, I wanted an account by them about this event. Well, I couldn't believe what I found. I found three other accounts of this event from a different perspective than I expected to. This account is called Colonel Dudley's Last Dance. And this is from 1884. At an Ohio reception last week, this is according to a reporter, I was standing by Colonel Dudley, the pension commissioner. Dudley goes on to become the commissioner of pensions for the Union veterans after the war in Washington, D.C. When a lady, noticing that he looked, um, he looked at the hundred couples who were whirling about the maze of Strauss waltzes with a wistful eye and asked, Do you not dance, Colonel? No, was the reply with a smile. I danced my last dance just before the Battle of Gettysburg. And he talks about how 
he and the Riddle Moser girls were dancing, and then he lost his leg into battle, and that stopped my dancing forever. <laughs> and then I found another account. This was a, um, four years later in a Kansas newspaper in 1888 where a, a representative from Kansas was at a dance in Washington, D.C., and there's Dudley. A few, at a party here a few nights ago, Dudley stood watching some young folks dancing. Don't you dance, Colonel? asked a pretty young matron. No, I'm sorry, I don't. I danced my last dance 25 years ago in July. And they go on to talk about how he lost his leg. So, Colonel Dudley's last dance with the Riddle Moser girls. I could go into more detail, but I think that's enough. You get the idea. Okay, oh, there's, there's, uh, there's my uh, picture of uh, uh, Dudley. And of course, he's, uh, he's um, uh, there he is buried in, I forget, I don't, I'm in right now where he's buried. You guys can look it up. Congressional Cemetery. Okay, that be good, very good. I was thinking, I was going to say D.C. <laughs> Because, of course, you know, again, he's the commissioner of pensions in Washington, D.C. Very good. So, on July 1st, the Iron Brigade marches to Gettysburg. Now, a couple things you should know. So, General Reynolds had been in communication with General Buford and headquarters in Tawnytown during the night, and they had messengers uh, riding back and forth. And... Um, you know, we, people argue about exactly what the plan for July 1st was, considering the fact that Meade will release his Pipe Creek Circular on July 1st. And you know, one thing, I, I don't think I agree with um, uh, Robertson's assessment of the plan that, in his latest Meade book. It's very complicated. But basically, it seems as if Meade has given Reynolds some latitude. And... Uh, Reynolds, the plan is to move forward to Gettysburg, meet the Confederates, and then all fall back to a pre-arranged defensive position back at Pipe Creek. But it seems as though through couriers, Meade has allowed Reynolds the um, option of going to Gettysburg, and then if the ground looks suitable, then he'll order, he'll send back a message to Reynolds and order the whole army up to Gettysburg. But in the meantime, Meade puts out his Pipe Creek Circular. So on the morning of July 1st, Reynolds gets up, he turns over command of the 1st Army Corps to Abner Doubleday. And Abner Doubleday is the one who gets everybody up and gets everybody on the road and starts a marching. In the meantime, Reynolds rides at Gettysburg. But as Reynolds is on his way to Gettysburg, the first shot of the battle is fired. A courier rides from the picket line to the headquarters of the 8th Illinois, and then another message is sent to the Eagle Hotel, the headquarters of John Buford, and then John Buford rides out to the seminary, and the battle has started. And Buford sends a message down the Emmitsburg Road to Reynolds saying, hey, it looks like they're approaching Gettysburg in heavy force. So Reynolds rides to the Eagle Hotel in Gettysburg and can't find Buford. And then he comes across this citizen named Peter Call, who tells him Reynolds has written out to the seminary cupola. And so he takes him out there or shows him where it is, and he rides out. That's where he meets Reynolds. And what's he yell up to Reynolds? How goes it? Or, what goes yeah, yeah. How Reynolds goes yells up to Buford, how goes it, John? And depending on the version you like, you know, there'll be the devil to pay or there will be hell to pay, depending on what of the two versions you like. So um, then Buford climbs down, and Reynolds and Buford ride out to Seminary Ridge and skin the situation, and then Reynolds rides back into the town. He looks around, realizes that he doesn't want the troops approaching to march through the town, and then starts to decide upon a way he can break down fences and get them across the fields from the Kadori farm over to Seminary Ridge without passing through the town. In the meantime, Abner Doubleday is back at the campsite near Marsh Creek, and for whatever reason, the Iron Brigade wasn't ready to move yet, so Cutler's Brigade marches by them and takes the lead to Gettysburg. 
And then the Iron Brigade comes up behind them and marches to Gettysburg behind them. There must have been a gap between Cutler's Brigade and the Iron Brigade. I say this because the Iron Brigade insists in every account that they write that they were in the lead that day and that they entered the battle first. And there's just no way. But in, I would say, Wisconsin newspapers after the Civil War, mostly in Wisconsin newspapers, just article after article after article after article asserting that they were first in the battle and that Cutler's Brigade are all liars. <laughs> no. there's, there's whole articles written about it. and It's, it's incredible. But... So Cutler's Brigade marches up the road to Gettysburg, and the Iron Brigade comes up behind them. And Cutler's Brigade enters the the battle first. So Reynolds rides out. This is a a painting uh, of the round tops in the background, and they're near the Kadori farm in the field of Pickett's Charge. And as Cutler's Brigade is advancing, they're sending them across the fields of Pickett's Charge up to Seminary Ridge to engage in the battle. Now, I point this out because almost... Well, Wadsworth's entire division cuts across the fields to get their, into position on Seminary Ridge and doesn't pass through the town. But in the regimental history of the 6th Wisconsin, there's a clear statement that they enter the town of Gettysburg, the band plays, the Campbells are coming, and they march through the town playing their band. And that quote makes it into most... Read, uh, most general histories of the battle that the Iron Brigade came through the town with the band playing, and clearly that is not the case. I have no idea why I put that in there. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, there are some accounts that said that the uh, medic group or some of the group came toward the town of Gettysburg on the 30th. Yes. So all the, the uh, cavalry there turned around and went back to Cash Town. The, um, the southerners turned around and went back to Cash Town. Yes. Okay. And if that happened, did Buford not see them? Um, no, Buford, uh, Buford's men shadowed, him, shadowed them back at a distance. They didn't overtake them, uh, but yes, they were still... Apparently, when Buford's guys ride into town, the last vestiges of Pettigrew's guys on June 30th are on Seminary Ridge, and they ride out on Seminary Ridge, and they follow them at a distance until they march all the way back to Marsh Creek, and then they stop on top of the hill, and, you know, there's all this, Michael Jacobs suggested the Confederates set up an ambush on either side of the road where they're waiting for the Union Cavalry to ride by, so they can take out two of them. I just think, you know, who, who are you ambushing? Is it really... Productive, kill one or two guys from each side. Some of Buford's guys claim they capture some of Pettigrew's guys. I, I doubt that. I really doubt that. But they do. They do know of each other's presence. Yes, they just don't encounter each other. Let me see. So, Lysander Cutler is the first Union brigade to arrive on the battlefield, and they actually uh, engage part of uh, Davis's Mississippi Brigade, Joseph Davis's Mississippi Brigade, out in the fields uh, west of the town. Now, General John Buford's Cavalry Division had been positioned in the fields west of the town on the morning of July 1st. And at distance, they are skirmishing with the advance of the Southern Army. And really, there's not too much interaction between Buford's guys and the Confederate Army. I know that people, for the uh, purposes of drama, uh, make it seem as if there's uh, some fighting between Buford, and Buford is desperately trying to cling to the position and just hoping that he'll be able to hold out long enough for the Union Army to arrive, the rest of the the Union infantry. Uh, The fact of the matter is that there's no, not really heavy fighting between these units. And the Iron Brigade and uh, Cutler's Brigade arrive in plenty of time to replace them before the infantry attack occurs uh, with General James Archer's Brigade and Davis's Brigade. And there's a couple statistics I can throw out to you right away that tell you that there's no real fighting. One of them is 
the 8th Illinois Infantry had one man killed in the battle. Yeah, and I think us guys on July 2nd. I don't know. Maybe not, but they got one man killed. Uh, the 5th Alabama Battalion, who were in front of Archer's Brigade as skirmishers against Buford's Cavalry on July 1st, have seven men wounded in the battle. So we don't even have any evidence whatsoever that Buford's men even killed a Southern soldier. <laughs> so, so, you know, the idea that there is a stubborn resistance is a little bit exaggerated. One would suspect to have a stubborn resistance, someone might have been hurt in that resistance. And we just don't have any evidence of that. But you're probably used to me picking on the cowboy. And again, you know, the reason I'm, I'm picking on the cavalry, the Iron Brigade is going to, going to lose the highest amount of men of any brigade in the battle. They're going to, there's going to be some heavy, heavy fighting on July 1st, just not in the morning action. But it's really, it's really interesting um, that I wanted to talk a little bit about the arrival of the Iron Brigade. I'm not going to even get into specific battle accounts because there's so much written about it, but I want to point out some different things about the battle as we go on here. Uh, but uh, I really like this picture. I think this was taken during the 150th anniversary. Um, uh, I forget who took it. I'm sure my friend who um, knows I'm using it will be upset for me for not telling you. But the people in the radio people all know what picture I'm even showing. So it's all right. <laughs> Here's one of my issues about uh, battlefield maps. You see battlefield maps or maps of the fighting. This one, for instance, showing the Iron Brigade going into action against General James Archer's Brigade on the morning of July 1st. And um, they move in a straight line. They have to come from the southern part of the map straight up the northern part of the map. And then they move across the map from left to right in a, in a you know, perpendicular fashion. And that is just absolutely not how it occurred. And one of the things that always annoys me in these maps is that the 24th Michigan, who are on the left of the brigade as they enter the fight, always have their flag along the Hagerstown Road, and by the time they go into the fighting, they're down here at the John Herps farm, and they're not even fighting against, you know, Archer's Brigade. They're way, way too far south. It just doesn't make any sense at all. And that's not how it was. We have this really interesting map. This is from the 1880s, and this is drawn by John Batchelder. And in this particular map, he shows um, uh, Buford's cavalrymen along the ridge, and he shows uh, Cutler's Brigade, and on the bottom of the map, we can see the Iron Brigade arriving and going to position. And on this particular map, he has actually the 2nd Wisconsin's already entered the fight, and then the 7th Wisconsin, the 19th, and the 24th Michigan. And they're coming across the fields in front of the seminary in column, and then they're swinging out into line and charging into the woods. So the 2nd Wisconsin there, the 7th Wisconsin, and this is probably more accurately how it happens. Do you notice that when the Iron Brigade arrives, um, General James Archer's Brigade is already crossing Willoughby's Run and starting up the field, and the 8th New York Cavalry actually engages Archer's Brigade. And the 8th New York have the highest casualties of any regiment in Buford's division during the first day because they actually fired into Archer's Brigade, and Archer's Brigade fired back. And so if you know what that monument is on Reynolds Avenue, just south of the Herbst Wood Lot or McPherson Wood Lot, um, you know, they're actually somewhat engaged in a battle. And I, I just find that fascinating that it, 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 you know, it shows on the map. Um, now this map, I'm showing a map that I found at the National Archives it was dated 1878. It's drawn by John Batchelor, and it kind of shows the Iron Brigade coming up across the Fairfield Road in front of the seminary and then breaking off Cutler's Brigade and the Iron Brigade and charging into Archer's Brigade along Willoughby's Run and in the Herbst Woodlot. 
And he actually even has a note there showing where uh, General Reynolds fell, which is pretty consistent with what he shows on his isometrical map that was drawn in um, 1863 when he was here after the battle. And here's a map. I, I don't want to call it a map. I want to call it a diagram that I made that kind of shows. I tried to, on this map, I did it for a seminar that we were involved in, and I was trying to show how I envisioned the Iron Brigade coming across the field on an angle. And the reason that I want to put them like this and have them going behind each other a little bit behind each other's dominoes, because this more accurately reflects how we think that the fighting occurred when they hit the units that were up along the, the ridge there. So, um, and of course also, Reynolds is killed somewhere as they enter the fight. Um, you might know that as the Iron Brigade arrived on the battlefield, there was total chaos in the fight. Cutler's Brigade had arrived first, and Reynolds rode over to Cutler and ordered Cutler's Brigade to move north of the Chambersburg Pike and uh, face off against um, General Joseph Davis, Mississippi and North Carolinians that were leading the attack. And that um, Reynolds had ordered them into position had ridden over to them, to Wadsworth. They had moved for, north of the pike. The 56th Pennsylvania of Cutler's Brigade fired the first infantry volley of the battle about 9.30 a.m. And then, even though he had told Wadsworth and had sent one of his couriers to Solomon Meredith's Iron Brigade, who were then coming up on the field, he decided to ride himself over to them. And he got this weird situation where Solomon Meredith is standing there with Lucis Fairchild, the colonel of the 2nd Wisconsin, and a courier comes from Wadsworth, and a courier comes from Reynolds with the same orders. And then Reynolds himself rides over to them. The 2nd Wisconsin are detached, and they are sent into the fight first. And um, I did have in my, I couldn't find it in my papers, but I have the exact order that's given to the 2nd Wisconsin, and it's something like, um, um, out of column, into line, uh, on the double quick, uh, march, load. They're not, they don't have loaded guns because they were just marching, and so the 2nd Wisconsin is ordered out of line from the rest of the brigade, they're thrown in from column of fours into line of battle, and they're on the double quick, and they have to load their weapons as they go. And then they're sent across the field, and they enter the woods and engage with Archer's Brigade ahead of the rest of the brigade by themselves. And when they head towards the McPherson's Ridge, as shown in this print, there's a slight rise of ground, and they go up and over where Reynolds Avenue is now on McPherson Ridge, and then enter the woods where Archer's Brigade is positioned. And because they don't do a very good job loading their muskets, by the time they engaged with Archer's Brigade, Archer just starts firing into them. And the second Wisconsin has 302 men at the battle. They'll lose 116 men in the morning action. And largely, it's because of this initial chaos when they enter the woods by themselves without the rest of the brigade and take on Archer's whole uh, crew. Of course, according to the accounts, um, Reynolds rides up uh, to the to the uh, Second Wisconsin, leads them personally, leads them in a charge, and then as they pass by him, he rides back looking for the next regiment coming on, which would be the Seventh Wisconsin Infantry, and they're still, you know, uh, they're still back. They haven't started to move forward yet, and um, he's yelling, "For God's sakes!" You know, forward men drive those Confederates from the woods. I have the exact quote. You can you can find it. But um, uh, and he turns to look for the oncoming uh, next regiment, and the bullet enters the back of his neck, and according to some accounts, comes out his eye, and he is dead. Uh, and you know, there are some accounts that suggest that he doesn't die right away. That 
they get him back to the seminary, and he's still trying to gurgle and say something. But most accounts suggest he's dead. He's dead immediately. And one thing that's interesting about Reynolds being killed in the battle is Reynolds was sent to Gettysburg theoretically with this um, tentative order to check out the situation, decide what we should do, and then you know we'll either fall back or we'll bring the army forward depending upon what you find. And then he gets to Gettysburg, decides that the southern army is marching to Gettysburg, doesn't want them to get that road hub. He grabs one of his messengers, or his aides, Stephen Weld, sends him to Tonytown, Maryland, to talk to Meade. He has just set the wheels in motion for the entire northern army to march to Gettysburg. And what's he do? He rides over and he leads a regiment in a charge. And you know what, what I find is interesting about Reynolds? Is Reynolds dies, obviously. And everybody talks about what a great general Reynolds would have been had he not been killed. I hope that when I die, I get credit for things that I didn't do. Why do we say that? Why do we think General Reynolds is going to be this great general? All he ever did was micromanage things. Do you know in the Seven Days Battle, he got captured because he was on the skirmish line showing skirmishers where they should fire? Maybe I'm over-exaggerating that point. But the guy should not have been leading a charge. Now, you can, order, you can argue that Reynolds saw that immediate situation and realized that the 2nd Wisconsin needed to be in the woods and charge into at that very moment, and he needed to make sure they were there. Of course, he had already sent a message to Wadsworth to send them in, and then he had already, you know, Meredith had always sent, you know, there was lots of messengers that were uh, taking the same message. But he led the charge himself, and he got killed leading the charge. And when he dies, whatever plan he had died with him. And no one else knows the plan that he had. So it was a very unfortunate incident for the Northern Army. There's one other thing I wanted to talk about with Reynolds' death here. And, you know, I'm showing you some prints, uh, um, some uh, images that have been painted of the Iron Brigade entering McPherson's Woods. Um, on July 1st, it's a very, very popular moment in the battle for print artists. Have you ever noticed this? That we have lots of moments in the battle where there's no illustrations whatsoever. But again, the Iron Brigade. I just love it. Here's another one. I don't even know who some of these are. Is this Keith Rocco? This is Mark Maritato. Oh, I know him. He did the cover for my book. Excellent. Mark Maritato. Yeah, he, co he comes here once in a while. Good guy. Yes. Okay, is this Keith Rocco? This is right, Keith Rocco. It's been a while since I, 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 I put these in the show. But again, here's Reynolds being killed. And now, do you see here um, the second Wisconsin is charging by him, right at the edge of the woods? And you see that Archer's Brigade is all the way up at the edge of the woods? This is something that I think everybody takes for granted now that we know about the battle. But i got to tell you, when I was a kid, when Alan Nolan's book came out, none of this was that clear. Um, people used to say that the, the second Wisconsin charged into the woodlot, charged all the way through the woodlot, which is like 300 yards, and then came out where their monument is, and then charged down the hill towards Willoughby's Run and met the, met the second Wisconsin down there. That was the common theme in most general books on the battle. I remember when I first started studying the battle in depth, I realized that there are clear accounts that Reynolds is killed by members of Archie's Brigade just as the second Wisconsin charges by him, just at the site where he's killed, and that it's ridiculous that people were writing this. But here's the thing that was interesting. Because most general histories of the battle had the 2nd Wisconsin meet Archer's Brigade near Willoughby's Run and not on the other edge of the woods. People had to come up with a reason why Reynolds was killed. 
And the reason was a sniper, a sharpshooter. And so what we ended up having was like 10 different accounts of how Reynolds was killed by sharpshooters. One of them, he was near Willoughby's Run. One of them, he's near the Herbs Farm. One of them, he's in a railroad cut in the 55th North Carolina. And I don't know if you ever read July 1st by um, uh, Dave Martin. He has a whole chapter about the different claims made after the war of who killed General Reynolds. And, you know, I just, it's one thing that I noticed about the battle. Generals just can't be killed by normal soldiers. It has to be like a dramatic incident or a sharpshooter that does it at a great distance or, you know. And in this case, it's clear that General Reynolds is killed by a volley from the Archer's Brigade from the edge of the woods as he's leading the 2nd Wisconsin in the charge. And we even have a crystal clear account by one of the men of the 2nd Wisconsin that turns around and sees him fall and tells you where he fell. So, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting in that manner. Now, what did General Reynolds fall? Probably near um, where Meredith Avenue, you know, um, uh, in Reynolds Woods meet. Uh, probably not near where the monument it is today. Um, but you probably know the story. In 1864, um, Reynolds Staff Officer Vail put an R on a tree near the spot where Reynolds was killed, and then you put a bigger R on another tree to draw your attention to the smaller R. <laughs> and then later those trees were taken down, and they put a sign on the tree, and that tree fell down, and then they hung the sign on another tree, and that tree fell down. And then here's a, here's a tree near the edge of, uh, on the total eastern, oh, no, this would be the northern side of the Herbstwood lot with the McPherson barn in the background. So my general comment is that when you talk about the Reynolds tree, there's probably been like six of them. Which one are you talking about? And you know, one uh, tree near the edge of, of Reynolds Woods was hit, uh, fell on a, tr a storm in the 1980s. And they started cutting it up and making desk sets out of it and calling it the Reynolds tree. And it wasn't even, you know, it was not even an early tree. It was a much later Reynolds tree. And I think they move the sign, cut the tree down, sell it, move the sign, cut the tree down, sell it. I don't know. But there's no clear, real Reynolds tree. There's just a sign on different trees saying that Reynolds fell here. So, but the monument, you know, it's probably not, it's put up in 1885, not by the um, guys who were um, actually in that part of the fight. But we're going to stop right now. We're going to take our break. And take a few minute break here in the middle. But the first thing we're going to do before our break is do our raffle tickets. Andy's going to bring the raffle tickets. Yeah. Okay. So there's, a, there's a, a few things that are interesting to know about if you uh, when you study the Iron Brigade's battle in the morning of July 1st. But one of them is the fact that uh, the second Wisconsin is detached from the rest of the Iron Brigade and goes into the fight by itself. And it seems like for a time, whether that time be five minutes um, or so, they are fighting Archer's Brigade by themselves. They enter the woods. And one thing I'd suggest you do for homework, and this is something a lot of people don't, I don't think, take the time to do. Uh, you might ride uh, out to Chambersburg Pike and turn on Stone Avenue and go around Meredith Avenue and come back up. But, you know, park at the Reynolds Fell marker at the beginning of Reynolds Woods and walk into Reynolds Woods and walk through Reynolds Woods. And the it's a slope that goes down and then you go up a hill and then you go over and down through another gully and up into another hill and then... It's a long woodlot. So if you're reading about the fight in uh, the woodlot, like in Alan Nolan's book, for instance, the 2nd Wisconsin charges into the woods, charges into Willoughby's Run, captures Archer's Brigade. And, you know, but it's much, much, much more complicated than that, and it's a long, running, gunning fight through the woods. 
So the second Wisconsin charges into the woodlot, and they take heavy fire from Archer's Brigade, and they lose a lot of men. Again, in the morning action, the second Wisconsin loses 116 casualties out of 302 men in a matter of minutes in the woodlot. But they draw the attention of Archer's Brigade or the units in front of them. And I'm not going to try to guess which units they might be. And then slowly the other units come, come on. And the other units that enter the fray with the uh, second Wisconsin or the seventh Wisconsin infantry, and then the 19th Indiana, and then the 24th Michigan from north to south. And again, here's one of the maps uh, that tends to show them marching in a straight north up the side of the map and going across the map from east to west in a exact perpendicular uh, you know, uh, uh, alignment, which just doesn't make any sense when you read where the various units strike. Uh, General James Archer's brigade from Alabama and Tennessee. Um, another thing about this particular map, you might notice on current maps of the battlefield that they put the 13th Alabama at this site on the right flank of Archer's Brigade. When all the historical maps ever drawn of the battle have the first Tennessee on the right flank of Archer's Brigade. And the simple story for this is that in like Gettysburg Magazine number three, maybe it's number four, there was a, a couple that were married, uh, Mark and Beth Storch, I think her name is. Do you know them? They're from Wisconsin. And they wrote an article about Archer's Brigade, and they found one account where a guy said, hey, I was in the 13th Alabama, and we're on the right flank of Archer's Brigade. So they, in their Gettysburg Magazine article, moved the 13th Alabama onto the right flank. And immediately, I was jumping up and down and screaming to anyone who would listen, to all five people that were interested in the subject. And I pointed out that there's a letter by William um, w. w. Dudley, and he mentions that when the 19th Indiana strike Archer's Brigade, they capture most of the guys in the 1st Tennessee who were on the right flank of Archer's Brigade. And I pointed out to them that Burkett Fry, who was in charge of Archer's Brigade after Bar Archer was captured, was interviewed by John Batchelor, and there's a letter in which he approves of John Batchelor's placement of his brigade on one of his maps. There's a lot of information. You can't just find one account and suggest something and then go changing it on a map, but it became like the cool thing for everybody to put the 13th Alabama on the right flank of Archer's Brigade. And, it, you know, it's just one of those things I'm constantly objecting to, the just moving of the regiments. So anyway, uh, you'll notice on some maps that the 1st Tennessee are shown on the right flank, and some maps are the 13th Alabama because of this um, confusion. I don't know. Um, I tried to explain this to Phil Lano, who did the maps of Gettysburg book. You know, I was just reading a review of that book, and of course, you probably know if you've been to my program how I feel about map makers, <laughs> plagiarists, <laughs> thieves. You know, I read this just recently. I read a blog about Phil Lano's book, and I'm not picking on Phil Lano specifically. But map makers in general. And this guy was saying how with Phil Lano's book, um, he doesn't want to get the original messed up, so he made a copy of every page in the book, and he takes the copy out when he comes to Gettysburg, and he said they're taking the book out. And I'm thinking, why don't you just make a copy of every map that he made a copy of when he put that book out? <laughs> Anyway, so um, you'd have to read his explanation, but I'm trying to explain to him all the complicated, um, uh, you know, speaking of Phil Lane as well. We all got two of them. Well, if you're worried about messing it up, just get two of them. Do you know how much it would cost to copy every page? Just get two of them. So, um, 
Here, uh, on this map, again, uh, uh, and you know, it's been a while since I put this uh, slideshow together, so I don't remember which uh, particular book this is out of. See, I just stole it out of their book. <laughs> you copied it. And it but here's the point. <laughs> so the second Wisconsin charge into the Herbst Woodlot, and they attract the attention of a portion, I don't know how we want portion them of Archer's Brigade. And then the second Wisconsin comes in and Archer's Brigade is holding these units. And then the 19th of Indiana swing down along the flank of Archer's Brigade. And the 24th Michigan charge by the flank of Archer's Brigade. And the 24th Michigan crosses Willoughby's Run pretty much unmolested and is behind Archer's Brigade and turns and starts marching northward. And for the troops, of Archer's Brigade that were in the woods, basically just kicking the butt of the second of Wisconsin, all of a sudden they're told, hey, you better get out of here. The Union Army is behind you on the other side of the creek. And then Archer's Brigade is in a world of hurt. Does he have a whole explanation for this? It's Lano's map that you're using. Oh, I'm using Lano's map. <laughs> How fitting. <laughs> I probably had an explanation of this in there. Well, let me just tell you, I don't feel bad. You want to see? You want to see what's my maps we copied in this book? We can talk after this. Yeah. So anyway, here's a map done by Kathy George in uh, in her um, work on the McPherson Farm Study. You know what I think is interesting? If you ever get a chance to see the original, though, this is online. Uh, you can find this book, but in the original at the National Park Service, Kathy George actually printed out, you know, she um, wrote this book for the National Park Service on the study of the fighting in the McPherson farm, and in every copy the Park Service has, she hand-colored the units on the map with uh, colored pencils. Isn't that cool? Yeah. It was done in the 70s, so it was a while back. But again, on her map, you see the 1st Tennessee is on the flank of Archer's Brigade. But basically, the 24th Michigan crosses the creek, gets on the flank of Archer's Brigade, and the units turn and just start rolling Archer's men up. And this is why General Archer and his men, a lot of them get captured along Willoughby's Run. So, a couple things. Um, you know, one of the things that is near and dear to my heart is the apostrophe S. So, so in, in how does Phil have it in his book? Does he have an apostrophe oh, S on well, Willoughby's Run? Let, let me consult. You must have an apostrophe S on Willoughby's Run. That's what it's called. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to write a letter to PennDOT. <laughs> have you noticed that PennDOT is changing all the road signs around and they're taking apostrophe S's off of all the road signs? So it's Hers Ridge, not Hers Ridge. And it's Will it be Run Road instead of Will it be Run Road? Yeah. They're taking the S off of stuff. Yep, no, nope. singular non -possessive. No apostrophe S in his bark. Look on the Warren map of the battle. It's, <laughs> it's Will it be Run. The guy's name is Will it be Winchester. Will it be Winchester, so Will it be Run's named after. Uh, local Adams County land owner. So, and, and all the good maps in Battlefield, it has the apostrophe S. So that's how, you know, that's how you can do it. Just go to a book, pull the book off, and if it has the apostrophe S, you can buy the book. If it doesn't, <laughs> it's not what you're talking about. <laughs> so here, um, you might not know this, but in 1867, 1867, the Tyson brothers, or probably C.J. Tyson, and it's probably little William Tipton that's the photographer, goes down to Willoughby's Run, and they record four views. We believe they're taken in May of 1867. Now, if you know anything about Willoughby's Run, it's right near the old Gettysburg Country Club, and in these photographs, there are rocks. And you cannot find these photograph locations today. Gary and I spent hours and hours looking for them. Um, Sue Boardman looked for them. Uh, Andrew Dalton, who wrote a book on uh, Willoughby's Run, you know, Beyond Willoughby's Run, he looked for them. And we, one of the captions says that the, that the photographs are taken between the springs, Catalyst and Springs, and the spot where Reynolds fell. 
So we got a pretty good idea of where along Willoughby's Run these, this rock that this guy is standing on must be, but it's not there. And the whole western side of Willoughby's Run, where the old country club is, has been bulldozed. And the rocks are just all torn up and misplaced. So if you want to walk down, you can see what we're talking about. But here's a guy standing on a rock at Willoughby's Run near where General Archer was captured. And here's another variant, if you haven't seen it, uh, where the same guy is sitting on the rock, the same rock. And then we have uh, a view looking the other way. And this guy, according to one of the captions on this, Charlie Croft, and Charles, Charles Croft, his grandfather had died. He lived in Philadelphia, but his grandfather had died in May of 1867. And that's one of the ways we can date this photograph. He came into town for the funeral. So we have uh, this photograph, and there's another one in him. Notice, look at it. See, he's laying on his cane. So we have four views taken of Willoughby's Run. Now, it's not that deep. It's not a very formidable creek, but there are quarries along the banks of Willoughby's Run. And um, the second Wisconsin, after Archer's Brigade retreats, the remnants of the second Wisconsin pull themselves together and chase Archer's Brigade directly through the woods and down the hill towards Willoughby's Run. And um, according to the accounts, it's an Irish name, Irishman, Patrick Mahoney, who um, uh, looks through the conf conf uh, retreating confused Confederates on the other side of the creek and sees General Archer. And he, according to the accounts, runs down the hill, crosses the creek, runs through the Confederate soldiers, and grabs General Archer and dives on him and holds him down. And then the Union Army cross over the creek, and Archer is captured. According to accounts, the first Confederate general captured from the Army of Northern Virginia, while Lee is in command during a battle. We have to put some qualifiers in there. Yeah, that's right. That's a few. You know, Robert E. Lee's son was captured prior to that. And he was a general, right? He was captured. Rooney, yeah. He was captured. He was captured. Yeah. Um, he was captured. Uh, maybe he was wounded and then captured when he overrun some kind of um, hospital site. So did you ever think about that? Robert E. Lee's son is a prisoner of war during the Battle of Gettysburg, and he yeah. probably knows it. Is he going to be mean to the prisoners? <laughs> I don't know. So anyway, Archer's captured. Um, Lieutenant Dennis Burke Daly comes upon Archer and um, Mahoney. Is it Mahoney? Is that his name? As as um as he's holding them down, and um, Archer's begs for relief, and he gets up. You have to. It's some Irish name. I'm not Irish. We're and then he ends up. Uh, Patrick Mahoney ends up dying later that day. But uh, Dennis Burke Daly ends up getting Archer's sword. And then you probably know the story. Um, he's retreating through the town of Gettysburg. I say you probably know, you probably don't know the story. He's retreating through the town of Gettysburg. Uh, the Confederates have sealed off the town. Um, he ends up in Mary McAllister's house. He asked her to hide um, the sword, and um, she hides it in some firewood or something like that. And then he comes back after the battle to get the sword back. But the sword isn't there because, um, who was it? Was it um, um, someone else took the sword and then he had to get the sword back from him? I think it might be Henry Morrow, do you remember? Yes. Henry yeah. Morrow ends up with the sword, the colonel of the 24th Michigan, and then later he gets the sword, and then, you know, it's a long story. But I guess that sword exists. I've seen pictures of it in a museum somewhere. Do you know where it is? It, no? I wear, you know, Morrow and uh, Maloney end up with them. Or Dave. Daly and Morrow end up in the uh, McAllister house. Yeah. And with that sword. They hide it up in the chimney, I think. Right uh -huh. But then he ends up getting it back, and he ends up with Archer's sword. So, um, oh, and then, of course, the greatest event of the Iron Brigade, you know, might know, uh, is in, um, it's, I think it's mentioned in the account of a guy named William Harry's um, in the second Wisconsin in his um, Mollus paper when he's reading a paper before the Wisconsin commandery of the military order of the Loyal Legion of the United States. And according to the account, um, Archer is brought up the hill and he's brought up there in defeat and there's Abner Doubleday. And according to the account, Abner Doubleday 
and James Archer were West Point classmates and knew each other well. Now, we know that Archer did not go to West Point. He went to Princeton. But we do know that Archer and um, uh, Doubleday served at Fort Brown in Virginia together in the pre-war army, so they do know each other. But according to the account, um, Abner Doubleday looks at Archer and says, well, Arch, I'm glad to see you. And Archer says, well, I'm not glad to see you by a damn sight. And he always die, dash out damn because it's such a bad word to say. Yeah, in the account. And then, um, you know, then Doubleday gets mad at Archer and yells, take him to the rear, take him to the rear. But it's one of those stories that's in every early Gettysburg book that Archer's captured. So um, I wanted to show you some other pictures of World of Peace Run. And you got to understand how the battle has changed over the years. So what do you think of this? Here's a picture of the 19th Indiana Monument. Think about where it is today. And, uh, you know, if you look south from it, we're looking down World of Peace Run after the Gettysburg Springs Hotel was established as a luxurious, you know, um, a vacation home for the veterans of the army and other wealthy visitors, and they blocked off and dammed Willoughby's Run, and there's a literal, you know, lake in Willoughby's Run, and the lake is like eight feet deep. And there's an account where in the 1870s, some seminary students with rowboats are crashing into each other, and one of the seminary students drowns in uh, the lake. And, of course, now you get down there and you splash across, and you I don't know if you can find a place where it's up to your knees. <laughs> yeah, further south it is. Yeah, further the, south. The closer you get to the Fairfield Road. So here, here's a view um, uh, from uh, the near the bridge at the, uh, what's it called, the Old Mill Road, near the Fairfield Road, and we're looking north. Yeah. And you can kind of see the DM blocking it, and you can see how... Even today, it's a little bit deeper there, near that uh, crossing. So we have that view of it, too. And, of course, you might know that the land west of Willoughby's Run was developed in the late 1860s. I mean, by 1869, there was this massive hotel near the site of, um, you know, the fight between Archer's Brigade and the Iron Brigade west of Willoughby's Run. And you can see the massive hotel... And you can see on our right the Catalyst Springs, where you can drink medicinal water from the springs. And you can take a bath in the water and, you know, cure all your ails. So, speaking of medicinal, let me get some. <laughs> so, there was a horse-drawn trolley that took you out to Willoughby's Run. And you can see here is the bridge over Willoughby's Run where the horse-drawn trolley took passengers. And if you look up in the middle of the photograph, maybe you see the horse-drawn trolley on the tracks. So, again, yes, again, for homework, we want you to go out there and find the abutments for the bridge over Willoughby's Run that are still there. And, you know, I have it on good authority that in the plan for opening up all the country club plot property west of War Will Be One that's now owned by the National Park Service, that the plan has them building a bridge over the abutments that are still there if they can get the abutments back into good shape. Isn't that a good idea? Yeah. And then you can walk down and walk across. across. That would be kind of cool to walk like the route of the Iron Brigade fight uh, back and over the bridge. So, um, According to the accounts, the Second Wisconsin captured Archer in a group of willows on the west side of Willoughby's Run. And on the Warren map of the battlefield, there's only really one area where there are trees on the west side of the Willow, uh, of the Willoughby's Run, and that's right where the medicinal springs is located. Can you see on this map where it says original spring? Yeah. Yeah, so right here somewhere is probably where the 2nd Wisconsin uh, made that capture. And you can see here the 24th Michigan shown on this map is crossing the creek. 
and driving up into Archer's flank. And you can see there, the first Tennessee. So John Archer was, um, I'm sorry, John Batchelder was not aware of the Gettysburg Magazine article that changed the 13th Alabama <laughs> in the first Tennessee. So he has an incorrect one in his map, obviously. Yeah, you think this guy wasn't talking to veterans of the battle? <clears throat> Now, the other thing I'd like to make, uh, make a mention of, and you see where it says, oh, I said original, medicinal springs. But you see Willoughby's Run shown on this map? And again, this is a map, a series of maps that was drawn by John Batchelder in the 1880s. They call them the hour-by-hour hour maps, although they're not really hour-by-hour. Hour. Uh, but the Park Service has the originals. And years ago, I was able to go to my camera and shoot these photographs from the original copies. That's why they're kind of, kind of dark. But I want to mention that after uh, Solomon Meriden's Iron Brigade crosses Willoughby's Run, they march all the way out to the center of what is now the Country Club property, to the center of uh, the golf course. You might see these woods here in the modern uh, road, Country Club Lane, goes along that uh, wood lot right there. And heads up. But uh, they, they moved pretty far across the stream and pretty far out across that land before they stopped. And there's a guy named, in the second Wisconsin, I think his name is um, Jonathan Bryan. And he's from Muncie, Pennsylvania. But he had joined the second Wisconsin. And he was the only man in the second Wisconsin, they say, that was killed west of Willoughby Run on July 1st. So he had crossed the stream and was leading a charge all the way out to the site of where the hotel was in the middle of what is you know, now the country club property out there. So they got pretty far before they then took fire from Brock and Brawl's brigade that had pushed forward to the edge of the tree line and tried to slow down the iron brigade. Yeah. Maybe they killed more people in this action than they did in their action against uh, in the afternoon. No, no, we shouldn't pick on Brock and Brawls, but we shouldn't work. No, we can't. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> but you might notice that they're pushed all the way out to the Emanuel Harmon farm, which, uh, you know, part of the year we occupied with our sharpshooters uh, temporarily in the uh, afternoon action. So they go pretty far out. Also, Abel Peck, the color bearer of the 24th Michigan, is killed west of Willoughby's Run in the fighting on July 1st. So we have accounts of them pushing forward. Now, at the same time that all this is taking place, the 6th Wisconsin were the last regiment of the Iron Brigade to arrive on the field. Abner Doubleday, who was kind of in charge of the 1st Army Corps because Reynolds had ridden forward and taken charge of the troops on the field, and then, of course, Reynolds got himself killed. But are you aware of the fact that just before Reynolds got killed, he sent one of his staff officers, or actually, it was Abner Doubleday's staff officer that had ridden to him, and then he sent that staff officer, officer back to Abner Doubleday, and the, the staff officer told him that Reynolds said something like, I will take care of the Chambersburg Turnpike, and you take care of the Fairfield Road. And so Abner Doubleday got this message when he was arriving on Seminary Ridge somewhere near the intersection of the Fairfield Road. And he learned that he had just sent two brigades to Reynolds and he was standing there by himself and had no troops around him. So he rode up to the rear of the Iron Brigade and he grabbed the 6th Wisconsin and he stopped them with the intention of using that unit to defend against any possible southern threat coming from the direction of the Fairfield Road. And again, this all makes sense, because remember the night before, um, Buford, the early morning before, Buford had gotten tangled with Confederates at Fairfield. And so Reynolds, when he's on Seminary Ridge, and he sees the Southern Army lining up on Seminary Ridge in the distance, and he's near, like, where his equestrian statue is on McPherson's Ridge, I mean, and he's looking west. He can't see past the Herbst woodlot 
and he doesn't know how far down Archer's Brigade extends. So he's just worried about the troops in front of him coming directly at him. But he doesn't know that there are no troops coming on the Fairfield Road. What if the Southern Army has another brigade and they're marching south of Archer up the Fairfield Road towards the Union line, the Union Army would be in trouble. So Doubleday is told to watch out, so he stops the 6th Wisconsin. This has all kinds of ramifications as the battle goes on. First of all, I don't think we need the 6th Wisconsin to charge next to the 24th Michigan, cross Willoughby's Run, and be involved in that battle. Archer loses two or 300 men you know, captured in that uh, action, and the rest of his men fall back to, um, you know, her, her, yeah, the trees, the wood line along her ridge. So they're not really needed in that battle. But he ends up stopping them, and on this particular map, which is in the John Batchelor 1880s map collection, he shows uh, the 6th Wisconsin. And it is an interesting, he shows the Iron Brigade Guard that is accompanying the 6th Wisconsin right there, and he holds them not far from um, the intersection with uh, the Fairfield Road and Seminary Ridge. And then, the 6th Wisconsin sort of just drift northward up across the field, and they're going to be very useful in uh, a few minutes in another action that occurs. And of course, that's the action where uh, General Joseph Davis's Mississippi and North Carolina Brigade has hit Cutler's Brigade, has driven Cutler's men back to Seminary Ridge and driven them across the college campus. And then Davis's Mississippi and North Carolinians actually occupy the unfinished railroad cut north of the Chambersburg Pike and fire into the flank of the rest of Cutler's Brigade and threaten the Iron Brigade that are charging across Willoughby's Run south of the Pike. And the 6th Wisconsin, Abner Doubleday is easily ordered up into this fight. They take up a position. The 14th Brooklyn and the 95th New York of Cutler's Brigade that were facing west were able to turn to fall back to the edge of the woods, and these three regiments join together and are able to charge over the Chambersburg Turnpike and into the unfinished railroad cut and hit Davis's Mississippi and North Carolinians. It worked out as if it was planned. And all the credit for this should be given to Abner Doubleday. I gotta tell you, to me, it's slightly annoying when you read Coddington. And I'm a big fan of Coddington. I love his work, but he hates Abner Doubleday. And he loves General Oliver Otis Howard. And I don't know why, but I like Abner Doubleday, and I don't like General Howard. <laughs> so it annoys me to see that, you know, in Coddington's book, and see if I'm wrong next time you read Coddington, because, you know... We all read Coddington like once every few weeks, don't we? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you should. For bedtime, you should have a dare. <laughs> next to your so, in that book, he makes comments like General Howard later stated, and then they have things like General Doubleday would later claim. You know, every time Doubleday, sometimes Doubleday, it's that, you know, we don't believe what he says. So Cunnington, it hurts him, and he will not give credit to Abner Doubleday for being the mastermind behind this attack on the railroad cut. So he doesn't, he doesn't, he he doesn't want to say that Abner Doubleday was the one responsible for the Sixth Wisconsin getting into the fight of the railroad cut. So just I mention that. Think about that next time you read that part of the book and how he presents it. But I give all credit to Abner Doubleday. Come on. The guy, he's not going to get credit for a lot. I mean, you know, people don't like him. He's probably not a really nice guy. He doesn't have many friends. Let's give him this one thing. <laughs> so the 6th Wisconsin, 95th New York, and 84th, the 14th Brooklyn, charge the 2nd Mississippi, the 42nd Mississippi, and part of the 55th North Carolina in the railroad cut. By all accounts, 
the 55th North Carolina were kind of chasing Cutler's Brigade. And when they did swing into the railroad cut, they go into the part of the railroad cut closer to Seminary Ridge that's like two or three feet deep. So they are able to retreat when time comes to get away. Unfortunately, the 2nd Mississippi and 42nd Mississippi drop into the deep part of the railroad cut and it, um, try this at some point. You know what I made Gary do? Gary, my friend Gary Adelman, and again, he lives in Chicago. He read a lot about the battle without being here. And he thought the railroad cut was easy to get out of. <laughs> so I made him run across the field, run down to the railroad cut, and I said, okay, I want you to run into the railroad cut, I'm going to film you, and run up the other side and get away <laughs> while the 6th Wisconsin are charging. And you know, he couldn't get out. <laughs> yeah, it was deeper than he thought. <laughs> so basically, yeah. basically, Davis's brigade swings around, takes up what they think is going to be a defensive position in a railroad cut. It's too deep. They can't climb up the other side to fire out. And then when the three Union regiments charge across, they end up getting charged down there or captured down there. And they're all escorted out of the railroad cut into the arms of the 6th Wisconsin. So about 300 Confederate soldiers are captured in the debacle of the railroad cut. And I won't bore you with the details. Service with the Six by Rufus Dawes. You can buy it. It's been reprinted. What a wonderful account of the battle. And I'll say this, too. The History Channel, Gettysburg, which I absolutely hated. The movie Gettysburg was much better. <laughs> but that documentary, um, especially the scenes where they show that were filmed in South Africa, yeah. where they show infantry combat in the Civil War without understanding infantry combat, are just horrible. But the opening scene of the Gettysburg movie is with Rufus Dawes in the 6th Wisconsin. And I was on the team that helped them write the beginning of the movie. And um, I know that Scott Hartwig suggested it also. They wanted characters that they could use and have in the first, the second, and the third day. So you think about who you can use in the first day and repeat them in the second and third day. And I chose Rufus Dolls. And I sent them Rufus Dolls stuff, and they went with it. So although I hated it, and I have a feeling they filmed it even before they knew what character they were going to use them for, in the beginning, when they shoot the Rufus Dahl stuff, that was inspired by my suggestion. So the Rufus Dahl doesn't have any teeth in the scene of the charge. <laughs> but um, it makes, again, great paintings, the charge of the 6th Wisconsin against the um, unfinished railroad cut. My favorite depiction of the railroad cut is from Charlie Weaver's museum. Do you remember Charlie Weaver's museum up the street? Yeah. He had a diorama of the capture of the Mississippi soldiers in a railroad cut. And do you know that that diorama was purchased by one of our tour guides, and it is in um, the, uh, what do they call that, the point? What is that called, Yeah, Jim? where the diorama, the diorama. The diorama. Oh, it's called the diorama? Yeah. Okay. But it's on Steinway Avenue. If you walk in the lobby, they have that diorama in there. But that's not the diorama of the diorama. But they have that on display in there still. Now, I just wanted to mention, you know, talk about changes. At the time of the battle, the unfinished railroad cut was the Thaddeus Stevens Tapeworm Railroad. It had been unfinished since the, 19, the 1830s. But they did lay tracks in the 1880s, and then they had to put a bridge over the railroad cut in the early years of the GBMA. And you might, I mentioned this in my Move Monuments program. There were monuments around the railroad cut placed by the Union veterans, and those monuments have all been moved. So they're all moved to monuments, because they replaced that bridge with a more modern bridge, and then tore that bridge down and replaced it with a more modern bridge. And when it did those movements, they built up a berm and had to move all these monuments. So they don't they never actually ever indicated the locations of those units during the battle. But for homework, 
The 6th Wisconsin has a right and a left flank marker showing where they charged into the railroad cut north of the Chambersburg Pike. For homework, find the right flank marker of the 6th Wisconsin. Have you done that? <laughs> Good. Love it. Love it. So after the morning action, there was a law in the battle, and the Iron Brigade realigned, and they probably thought their work was done. And then, of course, Pettigrew's brigade came up, smashed into the Union line in McPherson's woods, and it was heavy fighting in the afternoon action. And that's where the heavy losses of the Iron Brigade uh, really came about. And during that action in the afternoon, a young Gettysburg civilian. Okay, he was 69, but that's all right. 69 year old John Burns entered the fray. The monument, you know, in defense, the monument does say 72. That's written by Abner Doubleday. But he was 69. That's all right. They didn't know how old he was. He probably told him he was 72. But uh, John Burns uh, joined in battle with the 150th. Pennsylvania, and then they kind of sent him away. He joined the 2nd Wisconsin Infantry of the Iron Brigade, and he fought with the 2nd Wisconsin until he was wounded in the afternoon action. Now, I just wanted to mention that the woodlot today that we refer to as Reynolds Woods was owned by the Herbst family. They owned 160 acres. But in the official report of the 24th Michigan, they call it the McPherson Woodlot. And that name, the McPherson Woodlot, uh, kind of stuck. And everybody was calling it that. So in the early, I guess it was in the 1890s, the War Department decided to name it Reynolds Woods. And that's why the sign is on it, Reynolds Woods. The woods where Reynolds fell. But although, um, so you can call it whatever you like. The Herbst Woodlot, the McPherson Woodlot, the Reynolds Woods. And we do have this photograph of it. And uh, this is one of those uh, Matthew Brady photographs that he, he actually appears in the photograph on, on the right. And this is near the site of the John Burns Monument uh, on Stone Avenue. And we're looking down across the field into the edge of the Herps Woodlot. Do you see how open the Herps Woodlot is where this fighting occurred? And, uh, of course, you know, in the afternoon action, there's heavy fighting in the Herbst Woodlot. And I wanted to read you one of the more dramatic accounts of the battle for me. It's written by a guy named Robert um, Beckham, uh, Beecham. I'm sorry, Robert Beecham. He says, The grove was our citadel, and in itself furnished the means of a strong defense. Every tree was a breastwork every log a barricade, every bush a cover and concealment, and we made good use of every defensive object. And Abner Doubleday later goes on to say that the Herps Woodlot is the key to the entire Union defense west of the town. And as long as they hold that woodlot and fire out of the woods into the fields on both sides, they can control that area. And of course, attacking and driving the 24th Michigan and the other units 19th Indiana, of course, put, uh, had a, that's where they lost a lot of their men, um, put up a huge fight. Probably for about 45 minutes in actual time, these units fired into each other at close range in the woods. And eventually, they were driven out of the woods. But not before the 24th Michigan had lost more men than any other northern regiment in the battle. And Pettigrew's you know, lost a huge amount. Of course, they would be in Pickett's charge two days later, and of course that added to their casualty total. But the ferocity of the engagement in its woods was just something to, um, you know, uh, when you calculate out the casualties, there's just nothing that compares to it. And here's the John Batcher, John Batcher isometrical map that shows the Herbst Woodlot and shows, uh, you know, the units positioned in the center of the woods. And, you know, I, I encourage you to get out of your car and walk into the middle of the woodlot. Because 
It's like walking into the center of the wheat field. Who did I hear say, who was it that I heard say earlier, it, today was the first time they went to the center of the wheat field? Yeah. Well, you know, go to the center of the Herps Woodlot and spin around and, you know, imagine that you're in one of the bloodiest single places in all of American history. And the fighting that took place there was just so intense. It just, the, the numbers just are, are, you know, crazy. And um, the other thing about doing that is know that John Burns believed in ghosts. Another reason not to like him. <laughs> and, you know, from the day he fought there, he refused to go into the center of the woodlot because he believed the ghosts of the Confederates that he killed were chasing him. Yeah. Serves him right. I just tease. So, um, uh, you know, here's a map that uh, the guides did on the battle. And, you know, we, the, the battle line goes right through the middle of the woods. You know, um, and you know what's interesting also? They don't build a barricade in the middle of the woods. Don't you think that would have been a good idea to build a barricade there during that free time you have in the law on the battle? But that was not their mindset. And um, let me see what, I, what I'd have. Oh, and then, of course, the Iron Brigade, after they're driven out of the woods finally, they retreat back to Seminary Ridge, and they make a stand along uh, Seminary Ridge. This is a... Um, a stand made by the 24th Michigan halfway in the field between the McPherson Woodlot and Seminary Ridge during the retreat back to the buildings. Henry Morrow, who had actually been wounded several times, is defiantly grabs the flag and he's waving the flag as the survivors of the regiment are trying to hold back Pettigrew's brigade. Pettigrew loses a huge amount of men and they halt after the fighting at the uh, Woodlot and then, of course, Pender's division comes up, and Scale's brigade and Parent's brigade will take up the attack and launch a fresh attack against Seminary Ridge. This painting that was done by Dale Gowan, I was just one of the historical consultants on this painting. You know, when they had historical consultants with paintings? And uh, I got, so I got a free one on my wall at the house. I love that painting. And, of course, you know, two fresh Confederate brigades, if you want to count Daniel's brigade north of the Chambersburg Pike, uh, basically hit uh, the troops along Seminary Ridge in what just becomes a final stand. The Union line is bolstered by artillery, and there's some heavy fighting um, along that ridge, and, and the artillery really slows down the Confederate attacks. But the Confederate attacks are overwhelming, and they end up driving... Uh, the Union troops off of the ridge and back through the town. And, you know, the Lutheran uh, Seminary, Seminary Ridge Museum, has some excellent displays about the fighting along Seminary Ridge. Um, but it's actually pairings, South Carolinians, that break through the line south of the seminary, where the Iron Brigade is holding the line. It actually holds pretty well until the rest of the line collapses and the Union Army is forced to retreat through town. Now, I'd just like to mention that this is my map of the fighting on Seminary Ridge from my Lee's headquarters book. And uh, Gary is very, very, very proud of this map. <laughs> so if you see Gary Edelman, tell him that, oh, I liked your map in Tim's book on Lee's headquarters, if you want to butter him up. <laughs> Do you know what Gary did on the map that, that, that he thought was that he was being a genius and way ahead of his time? Instead of putting lines for troops, he put dots for troops. And he swears that he calculated the strength of the regiments, and he put the correct amount of dots on the map. And he, he did have blue dots where the Union lines are, and red dots for the Southern line. And he actually had, like if you look behind the seminary buildings, on the back side of the buildings, he has dots where wounded soldiers are laying. So he was really, really into this dot idea, and it just never, like, it's in, a, it's in a few of his books and a few of my books, and it just never caught on. But, you know, his career of a map maker was short-lived. <laughs> I wanted to mention that one of my favorite books on the Iron Brigade is Robert Beecham, Gettysburg, The Pivotal Battle of the War. It's uh, an account of the Battle of Gettysburg, but 
he was a participant and he was a member of the 2nd Wisconsin and his account of the fighting in McPherson Woodlot and on Seminary Ridge is very, very dramatic. And I use quotes from him throughout my uh, lease headquarters book that you might want to look at. So you can get that on the internet. Robert K. Beecham, Gettysburg, the pivotal battle of the war, or something like that. And then, like we say, the Iron Brigade, along with other northern soldiers, retreat through the town, and they take a position on Culp's Hill, where they spend the second and third day. And uh, i got to tell you this uh, one last story. Uh, Lucius Fairchild, the colonel of the 2nd Wisconsin, is wounded as the 2nd Wisconsin enter the woods. He's shot in the arm. He's taken into town. His arm will be amputated. Now, the lieutenant colonel of the 2nd Wisconsin is killed in that morning action. His name is George Stevens, and he's buried in the Soldiers National Cemetery. The highest ranking officer killed at the Battle of Gettysburg to be buried in our cemetery. Did you know that? Absolutely useless trivia. <laughs> Have you thought about that? Who? We don't have high-ranking people buried in our cemetery killed in the battle. So there's two lieutenant colonels, George Stevens and the 50, 59th New York guy. Who's that? Coleman. Who? Coleman. Oh, yeah. Max Toman. That's his name. Good. Good. So I knew you come through. John. Or John. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Jim. Jim. I knew you come through. Uh, so, uh, John who? Yeah, John who? It doesn't matter. <laughs> so one of my favorite stories, I picked up on this story in a book written in 1896 about the First Army Corps by a guy named Stein. And then later I realized that in Wisconsin State Library, they have a book about the life of Governor Lucius Fairchild. And I got the book. And in the book, Lucius Fairchild comes back to Gettysburg and gets his picture taken at the house on Chambersburg Street where his arm is amputated. 133 Chambersburg Street. You know what would be a cool book? The places around the town were wounded you know, officers. We know the name of the officer and what house they were in around the town. So Lucius Fairchild, um, there's a great story about him. So his arm is amputated. And then the Union Army is retreating through the town. And he gets some aides. He's, you know, dizzy. His arm is gone to take him out onto the sidewalk. And he's cheering the soldiers as they're retreating through the town. <laughs> he's he's bad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So they end up spending the night on Culp's Hill, the Iron Brigade. And if you read some sad stuff, Read, like, the 24th Michigan, um, their own Culp's Hill. You know, they had close to 500 men. They lost 400 of them. And the survivors are writing letters to their family about, you know, their brother's killed or their friends are killed and or somebody's missing and they don't know what happened to them. And there's a chapter about this in the Regimental History of the 24th Michigan. Are you aware of the fact that the 7th Indiana of Cutler's Brigade was on... Uh, was on um, detached duty and guarding the wagon train. And they missed the battle on July 1st. So they get on Culp's Hill. And, you know, it takes a while. It's around midnight. And all the regiments slowly fall to sleep. And it's quiet. And a guy in the 7th Indiana wakes up in the middle of the night and has a nightmare and he's screaming. And the Iron Brigade survivors jump up, run to the edge of the barricade they built, and start pouring volley after volley down the side of Culp Hill into the dark. And you can, you, you know, in Rufus Dolls is like trying to stop them from firing and sort it all out. Can you imagine the anxiety that night yeah. on the hill? And then eventually, you know, um, the troops of the Iron Brigade put up monuments in the first days, um, of the area of the Herbst Woods where they fought on the first day of the battle. And, you know, um, it's, it's, when you read about it, it's just hard to imagine the units that lose 70 and 80 percent of their men in the fighting. And of course, the Union Army goes on to win the battle, but they suffered heavily on July 1st out in these fields. 
um, you know, in McPherson's or Herbst or Reynolds Woods, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, I just don't think the first day gets as much attention as perhaps it should. So, you know, my, my homework is for you guys just to park your car and walk through those woods. You know, what better way can we honor these soldiers that were killed in the fight? Okay, well, thank you guys for coming.